Right. Welcome to this live streamed event from the Martinez Center Clint and from Stockholm, connected through Jonas Dalmose in Denmark. My name is Panilla Rossell. I'm sitting in Stockholm. I'm Swedish. But we are doing this together with Martina Center Clint in Denmark, thanks to technology, God willing, technology permitting, we could say. Uh, it is a talk based on Martinez cosmology, the Danish writer Martinez. And we want to present some reflections and thoughts on the present world situation today and perhaps on our personal situation as well, since we know that it has changed dramatically the last few weeks due to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so I will not give an introduction to Martinez's work. So I think that many of you who might be listening right now in Scandinavia and outside Scandinavia and perhaps later on the United States or anywhere else know Martinez already. If you don't, if you have no idea who this writer is, I would recommend you to have a look at the Martinez Institute's website, martinez.dk, where you will find films, uh, works and so on, where you could get some more information about him. But today I'm just going to give a brief talk, perhaps 30, 40 minutes, and present some key points, some reflections on the world situation and our personal situation, what it's like today, not because we have any definite answers, because we haven't, uh, but we who are interested in this particular work, the Cosmic Analysis by Martinez, we think that it's very rewarding to share those reflections with you right now. Uh, and that's why we want to do these live streaming events. This is the first one in English. We've done some in Danish before. And we are very happy to be connected with you in this way. I think that many of you, like myself, suddenly find yourselves isolated at home. You don't know what happened. Uh, but here we are and we can connect through the internet. At least we hope so. So, as I said, I will give a brief talk and then we will have a break. And after the break, I hope that I can be connected to my dear friend Mary McGovern in Copenhagen. So it's quite advanced what we're trying to do here, thanks to our technician. Uh, but before we do that, I have, as you can see here, some key points, some bullet points, as we could say. The first one would be adapting to a new reality. Uh, perhaps it's not a new reality to all of you. Some things look, some things look very familiar, but a colleague of mine, I work at the university in Stockholm, she just told me, okay, I'm fine, but... What happened? I mean, what just happened? How could this happen? Well, why are we closed? Why is everybody at home? I mean, we do understand it, but I don't think that we really, really get it. And we don't know how long it's going to last. And I think that's the same with many of you as well. Borders have been closed. Schools have been closed. Universities have been closed and so on. Uh, so just reflect a little on that would be the first thing. Then, what is the coronavirus and why has it struck us? That is, of course, a big question, and I don't pretend at all that I can answer it, but I have received some help from a dear friend of mine and a Martinez teacher colleague, Rune Östensson, who kindly offered to give me some help on that. So I talked to him and he gave me some ideas about how we could interpret uh, this situation. Why have we been... Why do we have to experience this? What, what is this virus and, and, and where does it come from? So I will try to share this with you and lean on his knowledge. Uh, any mistakes are due to my limited knowledge. Then, of course, briefly go into one of the many basic principles of Martinez. He has written lots and lots of cosmic analysis based on fundamental principles, and one of them being the principle of cause and effect, which of course we know from everyday life. In the material world, Martinez tells us that it also applies to our mental world, to our spiritual world. All the thoughts, all the actions that we produce will have an effect. And we'll talk more about that later on, or I will share that with you. Then, 
as you can see, we know I already said that this has affected me. It has affected friends and colleagues. And what happens when we find a world stricken by, struck by fear? Because I think that's one way to describe it. And this line, when your thinking gets kidnapped by fear, is a quote. It's not from Martinez himself. It's from a Swedish book on cosmic psychology. Uh, I will get back to that later on. I think it summarizes very well what what we could, uh, what we can see right now. I think our thinking, our thoughts seem to be kidnapped by fear. It could happen individually many times, but right now we seem to have a collective wave, I think, uh, of fear, fearful thoughts. And of course, the title of this lecture is To Find Hope and Meaning in challenging times, I wrote, and here it's even in the darkness. So I will end by trying to find some advice, perhaps, or just thoughts, ideas that we could use in order to find support in Martinez's analysis, to find, uh, to find hope, to find meaning in difficult times. Right, these are my so-called bullet points. And just start with the first one, a new reality. In a way, I think we know this, so it might be, might not be that valid just to to uh, repeat it. But and we get this news every day, every hour, in a way that might not be so healthy for us. But I just saw some numbers today; they are probably not even correct any longer. Uh, about three billion four hundred thousand confirmed cases of infected people, human beings on Earth. 400,000 deaths and a lot of people then again being recovered. It just says something about the impact and that we also have a very global sensitivity. Uh, we count this every day. We don't do that with people starving of, uh, with people dying from starvation, for example, but we are very, very keen on knowing exactly where are we with the coronavirus. And of course, one reason is that we are so connected. We are so sensitive. We have been traveling a lot. At the moment, we can't. But we have been traveling a lot, which means that we are also afraid of this virus being spread uh, without control, in a way, you could say. And of course, we know, we can see that in Sweden, in the US, in Europe, in many countries, in Denmark, I just heard. Global stock markets have fallen. We are steering towards a large global recession. Uh, and that, of course, has huge impacts and probably you know people who have lost their jobs or will lose their jobs or risk losing their jobs and I live in Scandinavia I consider myself to be extremely well situated in the respect that we live in in a state a welfare state but not all people are that lucky uh, so yeah we, we can just see that this crisis will have an impact that might last a lot longer than the actual virus will last. National borders have closed. So that was one of the first signs that I saw myself. The border to Denmark was closed. Uh, I mean, it had, we don't even need a passport in order to go to Denmark when I was a child. So it was very dramatic. And one of the first things that really made me sort of actually feel some kind of fear. What is happening? The borders to Germany is closed in Europe and so on. Uh, and we see that 64 global airlines, I read today, have completely stopped flying. So that's a very concrete change as well. Many people are working from home. We have restricted freedom in the sense that we shouldn't travel. Our own prime minister in Sweden has advocated against traveling uh, the whole summer, not abroad, not even within Sweden. Uh, some people think, by the way, that Sweden hasn't got any restrictions, which I think is a false image, because we do. Perhaps we trust a little more on, on sort of voluntary restrictions, but, but we do have a lot of restrictions in Sweden as well. And as I said, when it comes to traveling, uh, many people don't do that. We don't visit old parents and so on. So, so we, things have happened. It is a different reality. We can't meet physically the way we would like to do. We used to do. And one thing that I find very interesting, being a teacher myself by profession, more than 1.5 billion pupils and students, I hope I get it right, 
are now receiving online teaching almost overnight. Uh, actually, we would call it, I think, emergency remote teaching, perhaps rather than e-learning, because we just got one or two days in order to create some kind of emergency teaching. So it's not the best kind of online teaching, but we learn a lot. Uh, and the fact that we see this development uh, from a global perspective, all those children, all those students going through the same development, it's certainly very interesting from a spiritual point of view. What happens right now? What is happening? What effects will this have? So those are some of the facts, some of the things we can observe. And of course, we have so many other things. We have museums in Sweden closing down or risk closing down. Suddenly, people losing their jobs. We have conferences, concerts, festivals, events uh, of different kinds, sport events, usually very, very important things that we gather around, perhaps not personally, but I know many people who do, my sons, for example, and they're just being cancelled. So the things that we look forward to in the summer to to stick around, to enjoy these things together, that will be different. Uh, many religious festivities have been cancelled. We noticed that in Easter. We have Ramadan being cancelled, or at least being cancelled in the usual way. We have no services in Stockholm. We have online services, so again, we move online. That has an impact as well. In the beginning especially, we noticed, I think, that some supplies uh, just weren't able to be found any longer like toilet paper. Uh, I think that has sort of changed uh, now, uh, but we could see that people panicked in a way and just prepared for, for a long period of crisis or perhaps for worse things to come. We don't know. Uh, and that, of course, having Martinez's worldview as a basis and knowing that uh, he states that we have many, many, many lives behind us. Of course, we realize that those events trigger some kinds of, of uh, trigger behavior that because we need to be prepared. Uh, but I'll come back to that. We have rising bankruptcies and unemployment. Lots and lots of bankruptcies. I heard that confirmed this morning as well. You know, when it comes to Denmark, that it's really going very, very fast and we don't know where it's going to end. So, of course, that creates a lot of uncertainty. And for many people, perhaps personal disappointments and, and perhaps even disasters. We have social isolation and some negative effects. I'm not going to talk so much, so much about the negative effects, but we know there has been an increase in, in abuse against women also children. Uh, we know that more alcohol is being uh, bought, more people are gaming, also watching Netflix and things that is perhaps not so bad. But we also, I also read recently that people are counting on an increase in divorces and also in an increase in um, pregnancies. And that tells us something about what, what we do, what human behavior is like, as please, if we are bored or isolated. And of course, some positive effects as well. Some people, like myself personally, enjoy not having to travel so much to work and we have more time for reflection, uh, walking in nature and so on. So it it isn't always negative, but, but it certainly has some measurable negative effects. Digital activities are increasing massively. We see that as well, different kinds. Could be schooling, could be working. I tried to just buy a gadget for this live stream event. I had to visit three different stores because everything was sold out. Headsets and, and different kinds of adapters. No, sold out, sold out. Uh, we just see that those shops are really doing very, very well at the moment. Well, that's just so far. And I think that my own working place closed down on the 17th of March, which would be almost exactly one and a half months. So it has been six weeks. And we are being closed until September, at least closed, meaning we no students are allowed on our physical campus. Uh, so the interesting thing will be, what will the impact be like in summer or after the summer? I can't say I can predict it, but I think it's interesting to reflect on it. Right, moving on to my point two then, what is a virus, uh, which is perhaps a more difficult thing for me to talk about since my background is in the humanities. So I will just briefly 
go through the biological facts and then move on to the more spiritual perspective, which I think is the most interesting perspective for you. But you could read, it's very useful, but you can get knowledge when you don't know anything. You could read in the English uh, Wikipedia, a virus is a sub-microscopic infectious agent that replicates only inside the living cells of an organism. There are millions of types of viruses in our environment. Viruses are found in almost every ecosystem on Earth and are the most numerous type of biological entity, which I find interesting. You can see nature here in the picture, which is actually Clinton, Denmark, not far from where our technician Jonas is sitting right now. So imagine we have lots and lots of viruses which you can't see because they are very, very, very small, a lot smaller than bacteria, for example. Uh, and in this case, we have a virus that has turned harmful, turned to be harmful to us. And I think that most of you know then that people, at least traditional science, is counting on, even if researchers don't agree completely, but counting on uh, the origin being in an animal market in China where a dangerous virus was transmitted from animals, probably bats, at least that's one of the most general theories. Uh, so we do have viruses everywhere, but sometimes they turn dangerous. They turn out to be dangerous to us, as in this case, more dangerous than others. Some people get it badly. Some people um, hardly notice them. And you could ask yourself, why is that? And that is where I wanted to go on to uh, the um, world picture that we are talking about, the eternal world picture uh, written down by Martinez. And here you see his symbol, number 11, the eternal world picture, the living being to the eternal Godhead and the eternal sons of God. And what I wanted to ask my friend Rune then is exactly, okay, we know that a virus is something that you can investigate from a material point of view, but what, what is it really? Because something that scientists tell us when you listen to experts on television, a virus doesn't really live. It's sort of on the edge of being alive, something a being between almost alive but more mineral, at least that's what I get. And and then I ask then you know, what is it really from from our point of view? Because Martinez tells us is everything is alive, so a virus has to be something as well. And he confirmed that obviously. And if we have a look on the symbol, one of what which is sometimes also called the main symbols, we know that Martinez tells us that our existence and then he means the existence of all living beings, not just human beings, he means animals, um, plants, minerals, and, and spiritual beings that have no physical bodies are going through. And let's see if I can use my mouse. I think I can. <laughs> yes, Jonas confirms that. We can see that we have a spiral cycle. Uh, Beginning here, we could say slowly in the mineral kingdom, when we actually have mineral material, we know that we can observe it, but we don't experience this as a lie. But Martinez tells us, yes, it is connected to living beings with consciousness, but their day consciousness is on a spiritual plane. So they don't experience any pain or, or anything really on the physical plane. And then we move on to this red area, the plant kingdom. Uh, where being still based on the, they're still based on instinct, they still don't feel pain or anything in the physical world, but they start sort of, they start imagine, they start feeling something. Uh, they, they're just sensing something, something in the outer world, sort of beginning their existence into what Martinez would call a spiral cycle. And then we have the orange part here, which is actually the animal kingdom, where you see the earth in the middle. And this is the transition phase where we are placed, he calls us terrestrial human beings, half animals, half real human beings, the human, real human kingdom being the yellow part. And, and then we go on here up to higher spiritual, up to the higher spiritual parts of the spiral cycle. But the interesting thing here, I just invite you to read more about his fantastic symbols on our homepage, martinas.dk. The interesting thing is that Rune actually placed a virus somewhere here. So actually on the perhaps edge of being alive, of course it is alive, but it is just starting its journey into the plant kingdom. 
somewhere between the mineral kingdom and the plant kingdom, but somewhat closer to the plant kingdom, because it does contain information, a virus, but it can't reproduce unless it gets into a macro being, you could say, a cell. And when it does, it could reproduce massively, massively, massively. And of course, that's not good for our organisms. So yes, I mean, they are viruses driven by instinct. It's quite automatic. You could imagine that as a pre-stadium, if I understand it correctly, to plants. Because, of course, plants also want to reproduce massively. You know that if you have a garden. So somewhere here you have the virus. Lots and lots, millions of viruses. And somehow, sometimes they turn out to be harmful to us, as in the case of the coronavirus. And that's perhaps the more interesting questions. When do bacteria and viruses get harmful to us? He also called them seeds, seeds containing information. So they could be dormant, you could say, asleep for a long while. Uh, and then suddenly, with the right conditions, they could just sort of start to reproduce themselves, almost perhaps, I think, like, like an alien in an alien film, but you just sort of find some kind of life that tends to automatically just, just explode and you can't get rid of it. So, well, here we are, and here it would be somewhere virus beings. So they are beings like us, but in a completely different stage in the spiral cycle. And of course, that's a completely different perspective, not contradictory to physical science, I think, but it has so many other dimensions. And why then has the coronavirus struck us? And if we just start with, again, the non-spiritual science, but very humane, humanitarian uh, thinking. I, I'm sure that many of you know these scientists or, or these researchers, Dr. Greger, uh, physician, and Harari, a historian from Israel. And those are just two examples of many people who have pointed to what we would think is probably the most important connection between the coronavirus and our behavior, and that is how we behave and treat animals uh, and meat eating. And I'm sure we'll come back to that, Mary and I, later on. Uh, Dr. Greger uh, has written about food and the importance of food and the importance of treating animals well, but he also, which is very interesting, predicted the likelihood of a pandemic almost identical to the coronavirus already in 2008. And you can see that video on YouTube. And he shows us how disastrous, uh, which we already know, but perhaps we don't always have sort of the energy or, or the capacity to take it in. He shows us how disastrous our, our animal industry really is. And Harari, from a slightly different point of view, from Historia's point of view, actually says the same thing. Animals are the main victims of history and the treatment of domesticated animals in industrial farms is perhaps the worst crime in history. And of course, this isn't new, but in this case, we can see that for many, many reasons, people actually really point to the fact that we need to think about how we treat animals. Because if we don't, these waves of, of pandemics and epidemics will just return and return and return. At least that's the way I understand it. It's not the only reason, but it's an important reason especially since we started to treat animals in an industrial way. I mean, 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, perhaps they lived a relatively, they led a relatively happy life on a farm for a number of years before they were slaughtered. But today they live like in concentration camps. And Martinez also tells us that the karma, come back to cause and effect, that, that we can receive, uh, ex for example, in the Second World War when people experience concentration camps could actually be the result of treating animals in, in a very, very bad way. And it's also interesting to note that I was talking about fear in the beginning and I'd come back to fear, but it's interesting, I think, to imagine that the fear that people might experience right now might very well be similar to the fear that an animal feels, senses when being put to death. Yeah, I see that Jonas is nodding to me from the studio in <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not, 
it's not as if we can't think of that. I think that small children have a lot of empathy with, with animals and it's sort of a cultural tradition that they have learned not to listen to that empathy. Empathy. And I know that there's no coincidence that so many young people today are turning vegan and want to take care of the planet. And perhaps it's no, not a coincidence that the coronavirus so far doesn't seem to affect young people to the same uh, extent that it has affected older people. So from one point of view, yes, that is an important connection. And then moving on to Martinez's own text, he points out very, very clearly, and he wrote very early about the importance of food uh, and the dangers, the dangers of meat eating from several aspects. So he actually pointed out that there is a clear connection between uh, killing animals and the fear that we induce in them. Uh, you can see it here, since terrestrial people eat meat and take part in pursuing and destroying the life of more highly developed animals and inevitably bring about fear in animals, how could they themselves live in an atmosphere where, where there is no fear? So they sow fear and we must reap what we have sown. Uh, simply, you can read it for yourself. He puts it very, very clearly. And then back to this cosmic um, connection between whatever we do, whatever we think, all the actions that we have will inevitably return to us. So if we feel fear today, and I mean, Martinez tells us everyone will just act according to his or her own best possibilities. So we shouldn't just tell people or be angry at people for doing what they are doing, but you could think, consider yourself, if I do feel a lot of fear right now, where could I possibly cause fear in somebody else? Or have I caused fear in animals or perhaps just by buying food in the supermarket? We don't really see the connection. So he gives us these lines to think about, I think. The hidden spirit behind the killing trade, it's very aptly put, I think. So this is probably one of the global trends that I think is going to change very quickly. It already started, but I think that the coronavirus will certainly highlight this even more. And moving on to, I think, the third part, the third key point of this talk is, of course, to see this on an even higher level, not just that if we, in a concrete way, are harming animals, it could harm us because we shouldn't have that close contact with animals anyway. They are meant to be free outside. We shouldn't keep them inside. They are not born to be our slaves. It's, it's a mistake. Um, or it's something that we have done, but we must take the consequences. We can't do that in the future. But that goes for everything. So you see the, this in his symbol number 18, where he describes to us in one of the many examples, one of the many symbols he wrote, he drawed um, 100 symbols in all, that we have many, many different lives. We see those lives as orange sections here. We see the present life here uh, with our eternal being. And we see that we create with our arcs of fate, as he puts it, consisting of, of mother energy, whatever we create will create our future existence. So we want a happy life without fear then of course we need to think about our actions and our thoughts. He also says that whatever good we will do will also inevitably turn back to us, which is a good thing because then you can influence your fate today, even this afternoon by doing something good and you know that that will come back to you sooner or later. So it's a very optimistic view in that respect, but it could also explain that within this collective karma, because we now see that this virus is being used, Martinez would say, it's being used by providence in order to induce a collective karma wave. But it's not, it's not a matter, of, it's not random, it's not, not a matter of, of uh, this or that when it comes to who, who will get the virus, who will get ill, who will get very ill. It's always our individual karma. It's always what we need to know. And since I am a teacher, I also very much like the fact that Martinez uses the metaphor of the school of life, that life is a school. 
uh, because we know that when we go to school, especially as children, perhaps also students where I'm working, not all the lessons are equally easy or interesting. And we know that the teacher has hopefully planned the lessons uh, has a real plan, not just for one lesson, but for a series of lessons. And we need that if we go through with it, if we try to learn all the things, we will get a result, we have a goal, we will know more when we finish than we did before. Children want to learn how to read and write, even if they struggle on their way. And in the same way, I think that if we see this, it might be some hard lessons that we have to learn in these waves. But if we can trust that there is a good lesson planner, the best lesson planner ever actually, Providence or God, the Godhead, and that there is love behind all the lessons that we need to learn. We get individual feedback. Karma has sort of a negative tone, perhaps a negative sense, but if you look upon it as feedback and think about it, okay, now I really experienced this unpleasant experience, but I can learn from it. Because if I wouldn't get that experience, how could I ever develop? Because I know, we know that we always want to develop. That's even more important than having fun, I think, that we want to develop. So to have trust in God as the greatest teacher ever, uh, the best teacher, the best lesson planner that we have, uh, that we could imagine, and you could also have a private and intimate conversation with that lesson planner, would make it easier, perhaps, to see those patterns. Um, Yes, but I think it's also a very, very pedagogical way of showing us that this is a basic principle. It's not created, it's just is. You can't, it's not in that sense good or bad, it's just part of creation. It's part of the perfect balance between light and darkness that he calls love. And you can see the same in the next picture on the next slide where we have another uh, symbol showing the arcs of fate, uh, namely symbol number 16, the eternal body, where you can also see that we have our eternal body of being here with our eye and and and, and that all the all the things that we do uh, equals it x1, x2 and, and so on. But all the things that we do, all the thoughts that we send out to someone, if I send out a nice thought to Jonas right now or to Mary Copenhagen or to anyone that I don't like, <laughs> If I send out a bad thought or a negative thought or a positive thought, it will inevitably come back to me. So we can just trust in that principle. It will always work. It's very, very safe. And it means that we need to realize that there is no use in getting irritated. I think there is an expression in English, don't shoot the postman. I'm not sure. But I mean, why get irritated at the person bringing back the bad karma to you or the unpleasant karma to you? In a sense, I think it's no use being angry with the virus. Perhaps I could talk to you, Mary, about it later, because I think that many, many people said we should fight the virus. And yes, of course, we should protect our bodies, our health and our elderly. But, but to think of the virus as an enemy would be, I think, to, to diminish the fact that or just to oversee the fact that we actually cause this ourselves. It's not the virus. It's These are just living beings be doing what they are meant to do. So he says in this quote from the Cosmic Consciousness, everywhere one feels persecuted, feels punished by fate. And here again, you have this martyrdom feeling. No matter whether it shows itself as a direct persecution by one's fellow beings, or it shows itself as illness, sorrow, or poverty. So here we have illnesses. Indeed, no matter the nature of the suffering, from a cosmic point of view, be an absolutely natural manifestation of cause and effect. And it goes on on the next slide. Which in turn is a link, and here comes the positive side of it. So we have cause and effect, we did something not very good, we get an unpleasant effect. And then we see the positive side of it. It's the perfection of the great process of creation during which the earth is transformed from its state of fire to its present state where animal, love can, animal life can live there and through which it will be guided towards such a finished, such a finished state that current sufferings will be a thing of the past. And that's very important as well 
that it is a long, long, long journey of development. We remember the spiral cycle. It's a very, very long way from a virus to a human being. But we, in our turn, have a very, very long way to walk, to go, to develop many, many lives before we can turn into real human beings, uh, where we will now have, have no sufferings any longer. Uh, but it is a part of a development process. And if you also have time to walk more in nature right now, which many people have because we work home or we are isolated, we can certainly sense the huge organic process of development taking place in nature. So much life everywhere, so much development, so many interesting details. And why wouldn't that be the case with our development as well? Why would we be separate from nature? We aren't, according to Martinez. That's just sort of a human thought that humans are something else than nature. Right. So that would be sort of the high level where we find hope, support, I think, feel ill, and we see those big perspectives. And then perhaps we turn off the computer or we stop reading and we listen to the news. <laughs> and then we notice, at least I do, very often the difference between theory and practice. Right, uh, we know all that. Um, but we live here and now. Today is the 2nd May of 2020. And yes, many of us actually just ask, when will, every, when will everything get back to normal again? How can I cope with stress, fear and worry? I mean, the virus looks quite scary, actually. We see those pictures everywhere, like aliens once again. Uh, and how long will it take? When, when will I meet my parents or my grandchildren and, and when will we get back to work? Will it ever be normal? Will I ever be able to fly again? Will I die um, from the coronavirus? It could be so many things that we do fear about uh, or that we fear, think about. And to cope with this is, of course, not something we could just buy a book and learn, but there is the raw books. We have Martinez's own literature. He actually gives us many practical examples. And I think I get a lot of inspiration by reading and discussing his works with others. But I, as I said in the beginning, in my fourth key point, I also found this quote very, very suitable uh, to this question, namely the fact that we consist of two different mental sets, so to speak. Uh, you notice from the uh, symbol number 11, uh, the main symbol that we are in the middle, we are in a transition phase of being animals, which means that we have all the animal instincts in us, all the thought climates, Martinez has drawn them as well. So we have that side, it, it's working. We have practiced those talents in many lives. We can't just put them aside, Put, uh, even if we would like to, to push, a, push a, um, a button, perhaps. So what? this is the book that's not yet been translated into English. We hope it will be. It's called, uh, in, in Swedish, Livet en fråga om kärlek, and in English, Life, a question of love. And it's a book written by the psychologist Søren Green. I think that many of you listening to Swedish or Danish or English lectures know him. And he has written two books in Swedish and Danish uh, about cosmic psychology. And then we have this quote. Uh, we tend to experience all phobias, conflicts and problems of relationships more or less as a threat to our existence. And I think that's very, that's exactly what we do right now. We experience this coronavirus as a threat, a bigger threat than starvation, for example, even if perhaps more people die from it. It gets dramatic. The body is set into a stage of alarm and fighting as if life stands or falls by our victory against this inner or outer threat. So again, I think that is, we just move back to, to this slide. We can see, yes, we have a state of alarm. We, we want to protect ourselves. We, we get irritated, perhaps angry at our neighbors at other countries. I, I won't go much into nationalism, but we can, of course, see the tendencies of nations closing together, closing the borders, uh, being stronger than ever, perhaps. And uh, it goes on. 
for most people, our intelligence is not yet strong enough to consciously stop the fears that those instinctive systems of survival activate in our body. Consequently, in different areas, our thinking may be kidnapped by our fears. So we have again, yes, we think, we, we have an intellectual capacity. This capacity could actually be used perhaps to induce more fear because we could imagine all the bad things that could happen to us. Uh, and then we get even more nervous. And it's not strong enough, our capacity to love and, and the balance between intelligence and feeling is not yet strong enough to, to think logically. But we, are, we have the time to practice, so it's not a problem, but it's good to realize perhaps now our thinking has been kidnapped, or perhaps you could say hijacked in English, by our fears. Uh, and, and that is something that we should be generous talking about this. We shouldn't be, we, we shouldn't just think that that's necessarily a bad thing. We know we have these animal instincts. And we also know, and it says in the book as well, that our primary instinct as animals is the fear of death. So this is probably what this coronavirus pandemic triggers, the fear of death. It could be your own death. It could be death of your, of your family. Uh, I myself was very, very nervous because my two sons were abroad when this happened and borders closed. I perhaps wasn't nervous that it would get the virus, but I sort of was terrified that it wouldn't get home. So I could feel it triggered something which could be remembrances of past life or anything, but it triggered something. Uh, so, I mean, in the animal kingdoms, people kill each other and we have to protect ourselves. So uh, we enjoyed war and violence and so on earlier on. We, most of us don't do that any longer. So we just need to realize that this is part of it. And again, if we remember what Martinez tells us, okay, if I experience fear, is it because I do induce fear in other beings? How do I do treat people? How, tr how do I do treat animals? How, how do I treat my body, the microcosmic beings in my body? Because if you do experience fear, it's not perhaps the best environment to them either. So just to realize this is one step forward. And that realizing that, just thinking about it, practicing this, we have lots of time to practice like we have in school. We have many, many lessons. Uh, I think I will come to an end in this presentation. And that is the title of the lecture or this talk, To Find Hope in Meaning in challenging times or in the darkness. And uh, I haven't really talked a lot about God. Perhaps I will when I get connected to Mary, uh, because it's difficult to talk about Martina's analysis without talking about God, uh, about his definition of God being the driving force, being the entire universe. So you can talk to God. Many people think of God as being something connected to our old religions and, and being perhaps a strange concept that you can't relate to. So that's very, very individual. But also it says that many people in Sweden believe in something they call something. So if you don't want to call it God, you could just call it something and talk to something. And just feel that share your thoughts with something. It could be nature. Just try to share your thoughts and see if you can find meaning and hope doing that. Martinez tells us that we could practice prayer. He tells us it's very, very important that we can't, he doesn't understand that we dare to live without praying, I think. And he, even if he had cosmic consciousness, as he tells us in his books, he constantly prayed in the sense that he was constantly in contact with the Godhead, asking what was the right thing to do, the right thing to say, and so on. So when we learn to do that, when we realize that we have made all those mistakes, he tells us that we are rooted in God. Uh, and I feel that even if we don't always feel connected, it's like not being connected to a Wi-Fi. We know that the Wi-Fi is there, but we sometimes be connected, sometimes we're not. And that is mainly because of us. But if we can keep the feeling, just imagine, start theoretically imagining that it could be that we are rooted in something bigger and that there is a good meaning to this and that there is hope and that we could find hope by just reading more about it and talk about it. Well, you could just try it out and see what happens. And I know that many of you do, because if you're interested in this, you're already exploring this. Uh, and reading spiritual literature, for example, Martinez's works, 
could also be anything else that interests you, that gives you nourishment. Because if you do that, I, I wrote that later on, if you do things that promote not your animal sides of anger and fear and self-preservation, if you want to promote your humane sides, our humane thought climates, then you will feel better. At least you could try it out, but, but I think that most of us will feel better. I notice that I feel better when I listen to music, for example. Uh, you could read, you could practice art, creative things, literature, any of those things that belong to, to our real human, humane, positive sides, the things, peace, all the things that we're longing for, uh, where we actually know that even dying is perhaps not the worst thing that could happen. It doesn't mean that we want to die, but we could just see the perspectives. Martinez tells us we have many lives. Perhaps we need to endure an illness or even death. We will die <laughs> sometime or other. So it's just a question of when, uh, but it's not the worst thing that could happen. So try to practice those thoughts. We have lots of time to practice. You could find sanctuary in nature. I think many people do. And again, I'm privileged to be living in Scandinavia. But I think that many people are right now experiencing nature in a closer way than before. And this crisis tells us too, I think, that we really need to preserve nature. We have learned that from the younger generation following Greta Thunberg, that it's very, very important to take care of the earth as well. We could also, I think, limit the impact of negative news since we know that it gives us a lot of stress and feeling of not being in control. So you could keep informed, but you don't need to exaggerate, perhaps. That is just one way of finding hope and balance. And most importantly, probably try to stay connected. If you think it's impossible to think and try to be connected with God, we can be connected to our friends. Uh, it, we talk a lot about social distancing. I think we should call it physical distancing, because I think thanks to technology today, people seem to be more connected than ever. All those 1.5 billion children and students, they are connected to their teachers, uh, socially connected. So we're not disconnected and, and we should take care of all our friends and get nourishment from our friends and also, of course, take care of your microcosmos which I think I might talk more about with Mary after the break. These are just a few things that I know that friends of mine have brought up in earlier live streamings, and you might have other tips that you would like to share. And I would like to end by just giving a few more words from our master, if you could call him that. Uh, and it is about connecting, connect, connection, being connected. Uh, because we realize now, I think, even if our physical parts, which could actually be perhaps our animal parts, are restricted, we don't have the physical freedom, perhaps, that we like, that we are used to. But mentally, we are even closer than ever. I mean, I feel quite close to Clint, even if I'm not there and I don't know when I can come back. But I think I've been talking to people in Clint many times, for example, to Jonas in the studio. And I think we are connected. I'm very, very happy to be connected to you who might be listening right now or listening later on and to share your thoughts and views on this, even if you can't meet. I think it gets more important than ever to be connected in that sense. So then again, to conclude, we could see that we are connected. And I think this is a process of being aware of it, getting more aware of it than before. He says, looking at the quote, and this is from the first volume of uh, the Book of Life, Leavitt's Bow, his main work. Seen from a cosmic point of view, terrestrial mankind collectively consists of one assembled body in which each single individual makes up one unit, so all of us. The single individual's manifestation, therefore, cannot release itself in any other way whatsoever than by being identical with a participating factor in the fate formation of the whole of mankind. And that means that you and I and everyone else, we are actually very, very important. Nobody is more important than anyone, anyone else. Everyone is important. We are connected and we all participate in the fate formation of the whole of mankind. And I think this corona crisis, this pandemic, could be one really, really important 
event, important process where we could we could actually contribute to a better fate than we have before the pandemic. Right. I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much for listening and I hope that you will be back. We'll have 10 minutes break and then I hope I will be back with Mary. So bye for Stockholm. So Good. then we'll just begin again. Hello, begin Mary. Again. Very nice to see you. And you. And we are very new to this technology. So, yeah, yeah. we're learning new things all the time. We learn. <laughs> but we talked about being connected. And I usually visit you in Copenhagen physically. And it has been a while. So I would like to know, how are you in Copenhagen? Well, I'm fine. Um, you know, I divide my time between translating Martinus and teaching the Alexander technique. and. We got a message from the government two weeks ago saying that uh, people like me who work directly on people's bodies like chiropractors and physiotherapists and masseurs and so on, we should go back to work. So that was a bit of a shock because everyone is saying keep your distance, keep two meters from everyone else. And uh, I thought, how do you start work again? So, but luckily they sent out guidelines, so we have to work with visors on and give our pupils masks and um, take all kinds of hygienic measures. So it took me a week to set all that up. So I have opened again for business, but um, with a very much reduced number of pupils. So it's, so a, it's getting adapted to a new reality in a way. Yeah, I am adapting to a new reality and it's a little scary, but um, I try to take the attitude that I'm contributing to the reopening of society. And this is the way the Danish government has chosen, chosen to do it. But it was a bit of a shock. <laughs> After 40 years of teaching in one way, I have to yeah. find another way of doing it. So, yeah, so that's where I am at the moment. But otherwise, I have used the time well with translating Martinus and yeah. so on. As we said, those, this social distancing or physical distancing could be could mean negative effects, but also many positive effects. We've heard that from many friends. They do get more time in nature, more time perhaps to spend with close friends, close families and so on. But I don't know, Mary, I think that we received a few questions. We we would like yes. to arrange those live streaming so that it's possible with some kind of interaction. And I think that you received a question from somebody who might be asleep right now. But Yes, um, the Americans are still asleep and uh, they will be able to hear the recording afterwards. Yeah. So, um, but uh, a woman from Arizona wrote to us saying, um, she read, sent two questions. The first one is, what is the meaning of this coronavirus pandemic in terms of the Earth being? Briefly, it's my understanding that the Earth maybe cl cleansing itself, like we do cleanses and killing things inside of us, and thereby is creating a and or Earth is ill, such as having a fever or, or a cold, and this is the result. So that's the first question from Arizona. So what does the coronavirus pandemic mean for the Earth itself as a living being? I mean, it's an interesting question because I think it mirrors our traditions. You can see it in Shakespeare when we are covering an international audience that you always felt in those times in the Middle Ages that we were connected to our microbeing. We were connected to the earth. So what happened in to us uh, had some kind of connection to the microbeing. Uh, and certainly it has. But in Martinez's perspective, it's, of course, important to, to realize that we have hugely different time perspectives here uh, and that when we re when we have the perspective principle of perspective so what we experience as one day or one lifetime or, or several lifetimes would be something completely different for the earth which means that a virus that is very harmful to us wouldn't be anything in the earth's time perspective would hardly be noticed because it says that that would just be perhaps a very brief thought. I mean, even the Second World War, it brought so much suffering to us as the micro beings of the Earth, as the brain cells of the Earth. Uh, that meant just a few seconds to the Earth. So in that sense, uh, you couldn't say that a pandemic is a sign that the Earth is ill or has a fever. On the other hand, of course, Martinez points out that the Earth is in a stage of transition and so are we. So it's a correlation which means that when we perhaps incarnate 15 times, 
the earth might be undergoing a kind of crisis. That's the way I interpret it. We have brain cells too that disconnect and incarnate and disconnect and incarnate all the time. So I think that the question that the earth might be cleansing itself, certainly the earth, it's important for the earth that we as brain cells develop to be healthy and sound and under empathic and humane brain cells. That's our development path. And in that sense, this little experience is part of it, uh, but important to realize the different categories. We belong to completely different time perspectives, and we know that we have animals on Earth who live an entire day, and that would be the whole life of that animal. So it's a, it's a little bit similar, or ourselves, and so on. So I think that would be the answer, that uh, it doesn't mean anything concrete for the earth in that sense it could just be a thought but there is a correlation between our way of behavior and the earth and we are meant to develop in a way that is correlating to the earth's development of receiving cosmic consciousness what do you think mary would you like to to add to um that? i completely agree with you that the time perspectives are so different so what the earth is experiencing is just like a microsecond. Uh, I mean, if we have a year of this virus, which is probably likely, yeah, it's nothing more than a little thought for the Earth. But it's not inconceivable that the Earth could be ill because uh, the Earth is a living being. We can have a cold. And Martino says that the Earth is very, very close to cosmic consciousness. Yeah. But as long as it isn't, as long as it doesn't have cosmic consciousness, it doesn't have a perfect consciousness, and any kind of imperfection in the Earth's consciousness could result in some sort of illness. So it's not inconceivable, but it's um, it would be so microscopic. So um, yeah. I don't I don't think it's anything the Earth could notice really. Uh, mm. Is it maybe just something like a dry s skin cell falling off of our bodies that we don't notice that really? Um, I think it's on that level for the Earth really. Yes. And she had, a, uh, this um, listener from Arizona had another question. She says, one person said that the entire reason for this pandemic is the eating of meat, and that's all. It mm. seems to me it is more complex than that, and that there are other reasons, such as a combination. Or the main reason is something else, she asks. What do you think about that? Um, yeah. Well, of course, I, we, we touched on it, and it's complex. And I don't know if I made it clear enough. Of course, we have the meat eating as such. And Martina wrote, as you know, because you gave lectures about this in the United States uh, in the, on his early book, The Ideal Food. We have the meat eating that is not good for our bodies uh, in two senses because we do cause a lot of harm when we kill other beings. They feel fear and, and this is brought... <laughs> to us in the sense as a kind of karma. But then again, the actual meat is too coarse. It's not the ideal food for us is very clear when he points that out. So in that sense, meat eating calls illnesses, but in two ways you could say. And again, it's not the only reason for illnesses. Obviously, um, we talked about the virus and the pandemic and the coronavirus, but then he often tells us in the Eternal World Picture, volume five and six, for example, that many of our illnesses or really all our illnesses are products of short circuits in our electrical system, which means that it's very, very important what we think. Doesn't mean we should feel stressed because we don't have perfect thoughts, but we should realize that all these arcs of fate uh, that he talks about, it's not, it's not just actions, they're also our thoughts. So I think that people say that thoughts don't matter. But I know that Shakespeare again says that thoughts without words, or words without thoughts, never to have and go. And it's like the same, isn't it? If you don't, it does matter what we think. And, and he writes extensively about it. So I think meat eating would perhaps be one of the most important factors in this pandemic. Uh, but also, of course, in the general sense, everything that we do that could be harmful to other beings. And, yes. and very, very important to have the balance within our body. It's a complex yes. question. You would probably like to add something. Yeah. Yes, I think that um, also research shows that the um, 
um, factory farms and slaughterhouses, they mm. are breeding grounds for viruses. Yeah. And mm. I know um, President Trump um, uh, wanted to issue a decree, decree uh, um, a presidential order saying that the slaughterhouses uh, went the and the factory farms went back to work. Um, mm. And the, there's, to counter that, there's a movement against that because the doctors are saying, well, this is where the, the virus is. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the viruses are coming from. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and of course, you can get your protein from vegetables, which leads to fewer lifestyle illnesses. And you can see that the people who seem to be suffering the most are those who are already compromised health-wise. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. already, already maybe they're obese, maybe they have asthma or heart yeah. conditions, maybe yeah. they have um, arthritis or uh, immune defects and so on. So um, the more you can, I mean, one of the things I've been focusing on in this crisis is, is eating absolutely optimally. I mean, mm -hmm. vegan, whole food, very, very healthy food and doing my absolute best to to nourish myself with the best quality um, uh, food available, according to my own knowledge. <laughs> mm. and, uh, but if we did that as a planetary population, it would make an enormous difference to the occurrence of uh, viruses and uh, the level of health generally. And I think it's easy perhaps to imagine that we will have a lot of new knowledge, solid knowledge. There will be many, many studies since yes. I am sort of an academic by profession. I'm fascinated by all the kinds of data that will be gathered right now and that people will study. So those connections that you mentioned will certainly be proved in huge scientific studies, I think, and that will influence people's behavior because if you know something about cause and effect and people want to have a long and healthy life, they will certainly avoid doing those things. And there's a perfect logic behind viruses uh, being sort of created or, or being harmful in, in that kind of environment where other beings actually are very badly treated, I think. Mm. So then again, of course, we should remember that Martinez describes a very loving world picture. So if those people who have these different conditions uh, do have to endure this illness or other illnesses, it's not a punishment, even if it's, it's an effect. It's just something that you need to experience in order to develop. I think that's important to, to realize. So it means that next life you will, or perhaps later on in this life, you will have better prerequisites to, to, to deal with it. You will feel differently. If we are vegans today, I mean, it doesn't mean we weren't 100 years and 200 years ago. We have had some no. experiences. So no, and I'd, I'd just make like to make it clear that vegan is not a guarantee that you won't get um, the coronavirus. <laughs> but, no. Uh, uh, but I'm also uh, impressed by the generosity of uh, various nutrition experts who I'm interested in. They're putting out an awful lot of stuff free online, courses, lectures, mm -hmm. talks, interviews, to, to help people uh, promote their uh, immune systems and uh, build, build themselves up and make themselves he healthier. So, yeah. So generous and something that we see. And since you just mentioned it, I could just also mention we do this live stream for free we really want to, to do this for everyone who's interested if you would like to donate something please feel free to do it we are actually dependent since we had to cancel all our physical courses in the martina center clinic you will find the information below the this film if you would like to donate a small sum or whatever kind of sum it would be very welcome so that we can so continue, continue, with continue with this but, that's just in parenthesis. And we see that this digital connecting increases all the time. You can take part in so many courses now and it doesn't matter where you are. Mm. Yeah, you talked about the heart, I think, and other things. Anything else, Mary, that you would like well, to Well, I, I, think, I think it would be um, worth um, going into prayer a bit more because yeah. Martinez describes prayer as something we can use uh, to help us in difficult situations. We can also use it in yeah. positive situations. Um, but he makes a clear difference between what prayer can help us with and what it can't. Yeah. For example, he says that prayer can't change our fate. Mm -hmm. We set some causes in motion and they come back to us. Um, but they can 
uh, prayer can change how we take our faith. He says prayer can do three things. It can give us strength and courage and inspiration to cope with our situation. And um, I mean, just reading that myself, I, I felt strengthened and energized and think, well, I can manage this. <laughs> um, That's lovely. Yes. And he, I, there was a famous um, uh, talk Martinez gave, a question and answer session he gave, I think it was in 1975 or 78, um, I think it was 75, I wasn't there, um, when um, he talked to the young volunteers in Clint and he was talking about a future world war, a, a third world war and so on and someone asked him, what should we do when the catastrophe comes? And he said, well, it was very important to keep oneself on an even keel. Yeah. In other words, keep yourself in balance. And, and for me, prayer is one way of keeping myself more or less in balance. I'm not saying I'm managing it 100%, mm -hmm. but it's a way of working on keeping myself in balance mm -hmm. and uh, giving me strength, giving me courage. So I don't know... Um, how do you experience prayer in this situation? No, I'm, I'm just sort of laughing because I, in a much more primitive way than, than uh, you describe it now, I, I remember I mentioned that my two sons were abroad in the beginning of this corona crisis. And I remember I sort of fell back into a very naive praying, like, if you could just let them come home, God, I, I, will, I won't ask for anything else. <laughs> or I will be good for the rest of my life. And then, of course, I realized that's not the right way to use a prayer, but it's sort of a, the re typical regression that, that we can experience in, in the kind of crisis and stress. But, yeah. I mean, to read about prayer, the way he talks about prayer as an intimate conversation with God, mm. uh, where you can actually be forgiven, but you can have all your childish thoughts, your mature thoughts, perhaps, and, and just reveal everything that perhaps you don't even want to reveal in, in a live streaming like this. Uh, I know that we have a lecture next week. I could mention that, by the way, that next week, 1430, we have Ingvar Nilsson, who will talk about everything being perfect in the moment as it is. So please don't miss Ingvar next time. And I know that he wants... Uh, in Danish. In Danish. In Danish, yes, in yes. Danish. He once said that this intimate conversation with God is so intimate that there are things that you wouldn't convey to anyone else. And I think that's wonderful. But also, of course, to realize the logic and that you can't use prayer just as a wish list the way I did. <laughs> but I, I would like to have that. And yeah. if you could just give me that, I don't need that. Uh, so that would be sort of the childish way to look upon prayer in, in earlier stages of development, but to realize that it's logic. And he actually says in the book, Mystery of Prayer, that if we can use it in the right way, we can't stop being ill, perhaps, if that's our fate, but we don't have to suffer so much from it. So we can actually be relieved from suffering, also in combination, I think, with spiritual science. So we really need to study the analysis in combination with prayer. So I think it's great that you bring it up because that's probably one of the most important areas of study. We think that it's just about prayer, but we need to study it to practice it, I think. He, he also talked about um, our vitality, our vital force, that it's very easy to become depressed or pessimistic or nervous or afraid. Yeah. Um, or even bitter, and uh, there can be a lot of blaming. Some people are blaming the Chinese. Some people are blaming the slaughterhouses, <laughs> and so on. So, and um, of course, all of these things have to invest, be investigated. They they have to look at these different okay. things. Um, but it's um, it's very important to keep your vitality, keep your uh, vital force up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can use prayer to do that. To to find something positive in the darkness. And, uh, and of course, in the ultimate sense, there is no darkness that we experience that we don't have to experience. Mm. He says we're on a journey. We're going towards cosmic consciousness, every one of us. But that includes going through a dark epoch where we have to experience the culmination of darkness. So we could, we could see this 
period we're going through now. And if it's going to be a year, that's quite a long time for us. And if you're mm. 10 years old, it's a tenth of your life so far. If you're 14 years mm. old, it's a 14th of your life. So it's quite a long time. But we could see it as a kind of accelerated evolution. Mm. Martinus has this image of God as a kind of sculptor modeling our consciousness. So I think that's what's happening now. We're, we're, we're having to look at the way our society is structured. Uh, we see massive unemployment uh, occurring yeah, exactly. all over the world, particularly in the United States. And as you said, Penilla, you, you're very happy to be living in a welfare society. So am I. Mm -hmm. But there, there are lots of places where yeah. there's no yeah. support. You, you can lose your house. You can yeah. lose your income. You can lose your health insurance and so on. Mm -hmm. So... Um, there's an awful lot to look at in yeah. society. So um, I know in Scandinavian countries we place a lot of emphasis on solidarity. It's like mm -hmm. one for all and all for one. And it's not the case in many other countries. So all of these things have to be looked at. And this enormous amount of suffering that will result from this virus will promote some sort of development in those areas, I believe. But it won't come without suffering, I'm sure. Certainly, we can talk a lot, perhaps not today, but about the economic system and, yeah. and how this would sort of influence the economic financial system. And we see that, I mean, the state, universities and schools, they don't go bankrupt after a few weeks, but many, many yeah. private firms do, because that's the kind of capitalism that we have. So we see how can we organize an efficient society where everybody's provided with what they need. And of course, Martinez writes a lot about that in the first volume mm -hmm. of the Book of Life. You can read it on our homepage if you want to have that kind of comfort that you're talking about, that even if yes. you go through a period of learning, perhaps it's mm. a period of learning uh, rather than of darkness, but we could certainly experience this of darkness and suffering and pain. I think we should be quite honest to see that it's quite could be quite difficult times that we have ahead of us. And Martinez yes. told us that there will be difficult times and when they come, and perhaps they have come right now, mm. uh, then yeah. it's very important to keep up your balance, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and of course, all this suffering is leading to the growth of empathy. And yeah. the, the Danish Prime Minister here, Mette Frederiksen, she has said that she is so impressed by the way people are helping one yeah. another. I can say my own colleagues, we are helping each other find out how to start restart our practices and where to get hold of visors, where to get hold of masks and uh, uh, sanitizing liquid and so on, hand drops and so on, all this kind of thing. So we've been helping each other. So there's been a really a spirit of helpfulness and uh, like we're all in the same boat. <laughs> exactly. And it's like one humanity, isn't mm, it? Yeah, absolutely. Right, so we could just go back and read. The Mystery of Prayer, for example, or any other books, I think it's perhaps time to wrap it up for today. It's yes. extremely nice to be connected with the two of you, yes. you have in Clint and, and Mary in Copenhagen. Uh, but as I said, Ingvar Nilsson will be back in Danish in a week. I hope that you will be with us. And we certainly hope that we can meet you uh, in our summer courses. And for our English-speaking guests outside of Scandinavia, we will think of something to offer you online if we can't meet physically as we usually do. So thank you so much for listening. And I think that's goodbye for now from Stockholm. And goodbye from Copenhagen. Yes. And, and please take care. Take care. Keep well, everybody.